Christian Boursier. So please, what's new in the eye surgery? Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Philippe, for your welcome and kind introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you also, George, for your invitation to talk about uh, eye surgery. It's a pleasure to be here. We still have nothing to disclose. As an introduction, uh, to be very honest, I have to say that robotic surgery has no added value in the physiology. Yes, I mean why, Philip? And there are three reasons. The first reason is that eye surgery is already minimally invasive microsurgery with excellent results. The second reason is that we already work like robots. For example, cataract surgery is a quick, standard, low complication surgery. One surgeon can perform up to 15 procedures per day. And more recently, femtosecond lasers can now assist during some steps, such as corneal incisions, capsulorexis, and lens fragmentation. We also work like robots when performing keratoplasties, doing repetitive sutures cornea refractive surgery with one more time femtosomal lasers or retinal surgery using <coughs> optical viewing systems. We don't need endoscopy. In addition, our imaging systems have excellent resolution, pathology visualization of tissue anatomy and histology, cells, vessels, and nerves can now be seen in the retina and cornea. The third reason is that a microsurgical robot is not commercially available at this time and to our knowledge. So doing eye surgery, microsurgery with a microsurgical robot might sound like playing the violin with boxing gloves. If we look at the results being done, a number of ophthalmological papers has therefore remained very low since the first publication in 1995. There are nonetheless many potential advantages to the use of robotics in eye surgery, such as increased precision, better ergonomics, improved patient access to surgeons, and surgical training. As a result, robotics could improve patient care. The old version, the IG version of the Da Vinci robot has already been used in experimental conditions to suture corneal laceration, to perform keratoplasties and to remove foreign bodies, lens capsules, and vitreous. However, the offers reported a lack of precision due to poor visualization of the operative field and the absence of microsurgical instruments. Surgery lasted longer, and these elements were considered to be hurdles to further clinical investigations. We had the opportunity to use the SI HD and more recently the XI version of the Da Vinci system at the Arcade Center in Strasbourg, and we perform various superior surface surgeries on pig and more recently on human eyes using microsurgical instruments that are currently available. So at the end of this phase, we concluded that robotically assisted ocular surface surgery might be technically feasible for humans. The decision to perform amniotic membrane transplant surgery in the clinical setting was taken because it is one of the most simple, safe, and common procedures in ocular surgery. In other words, we wanted to start with low risk surgery. The study was approved by the local ethics committee and the French National Agency for Medical Devices. Its aim to investigate the feasibility of robotically assisted ocular surface surgery. We included three patients with persistent and painful corneal, corneal ulceration and low visual acuity. We use the Da Vinci SIHD surgical system of Strasbourg University Hospital. General anesthesia was practiced on each patient. The patient card was installed at the patient head. An assistant was present near the patient to change the tools and to irrigate the cornea during surgery. The arms were inclined at a 45 to 60 degree angle uh, to the surgical field in a triangular fashion. The camera was oriented vertically above the eye. Motion scaling was set to 1.5 to 1 ratio. Procedure started with scarification of the cornea. We used a fine tissue forceps arm number one and a snap fit scalpel arm number two to remove loose corneal epithelium. 
A 12 by 12 millimeter piece of amniotic membrane was then prepared. And a single layer of a membrane was delicately detached from its support with two black diamond microforceps. <coughs> a patch was then placed <coughs> over the cornea surface and it was secured to the conjunctiva with eight inter to eight zero polyglactine sutures. Each suture had three loops and was done with two black diamond microforceps. The mean operative time was 30 minutes instead of 20 minutes with manual surgery. But the Da Vinci provided appropriate dexterity to perform delicate ocular surface manipulations. Robotic tools were safe for ocular tissues and the membrane also. At the end of surgery, a resident used a second console. He was able to manipulate R number three and to cut the thread with pot scissors, as we usually do in a manual surgery. At the end of surgery, a bandage contact lens was placed over the cornea. <coughs> Three consecutive procedures were performed on the same day. This was in June 2014. There were no complications and no need to convert to manual surgery, and all three patients went home on post-operative day number one. Follow-up was unremarkable for each patient. The decision to perform now a pterygium surgery was logically the next step, as it is technically more difficult by an analytic <coughs> membrane transplant. You can see here a nasal and temporal pterygium over a cornea. Surgery started with a dissection of the pterygium head using fine tissue forceps, snap fit scalpel, and pot scissors. We use a cautery hook for coagulation. A superior conjunctival graft was then prepared and secured to the nasal area of excision with A0 polyglactine sutures. The temporal area of excision was closed with two additional stitches. And at the end of surgery, the cornea was scrapped with a small prescient blade, as you can see. Operative time was 60 minutes instead of 20 to 30 minutes with manual surgery. There were no complications and no need to convert. Follow-up was unremarkable. We appreciated the mobility of the arms, <coughs> motion scaling and tremor filtration that provided good quality surgical movements. The millimetric precision as well as the resolution of 3D image were acceptable for ocular surface surgery but not sufficient for intraocular surgery. The robot is useful when we have to work on patients with difficult access. And finally, we appreciated being able to manipulate the three arms at the same time as we usually do for teaching. We hope that continuing R&D will bring about technical improvements, such as specific instruments for high surgery, <coughs> increased precision, we need micrometer, not millimeter, but micron, automatization of repetitive movements, lasers, and imaging systems. Many experimental prototypes, prototypes uh, dedicated to our surgery have been developed you know, over the last 15 years, the IRIS system is one of these. It has been used in experimental condition to perform both anterior segment and posterior segment intraocular surgery. Precision appears to be excellent, but currently none of these prototypes are FDA or CI approved. To conclude, robotic surgery is now a clinical reality in ophthalmology. The first patient are French. Even though there is currently no improvement to clinical practice and therefore no added value, we believe that future studies will allow the definition of override indications. One direction we might look is the cornea neurotization using the non ophthalmic branches of the supraorbital and supratrochlear nerves. These sensory nerves are located under the skin of the forehead. We have then to suture this nerve to generate homolateral or contralateral cornea. As you can see, 
on this picture of a camera and the two ramps were introduced at the base of a skate line, this robotic approach is less invasive than the classic bicoral and incision. And uh, we hope to, uh, in conclusion, to uh, see you forward uh, at the next RAMSES meeting next year to present uh, the first results, the first clinical results of this uh, corneal neurotization. Thank you for your attention.